Hey, thank you for joining us for our online service today. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm Pastor Spud. We'll see you afterwards. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us today as we continue in our series, In God We Trust. Um, in God We Trust, do we? Uh, so each week in this four-week series, we are just kind of asking ourselves that question, do we trust God or do we trust our finances, our ability to provide for ourselves, our ability to acquire things more than we trust God? And I said that we're going to have talk about four different attitudes that the Bible talks us about um, that we're to have regarding our finances. Last week, we talked about contentment, being able to be content and what that looks like and how do we start that process of learning to be content. Today, I want to talk about the topic of worship. Um, you know, Jesus quoted Isaiah in Matthew 15, verse 8. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips. What they say, they're saying they worship me, they revere me, but their hearts are far away. The word that he used for honor there is temeso. Temeso means to esteem, to give great value to. And he's saying that the people were giving great value to him. They were esteeming him with their mouths. But when it came to their hearts, he uses the word cardia there, cardia, um, which expresses where our desires, our affections, and our passions come from. And he says, we're honoring him with our lips, but our desire, our affections, our passions are actually not for him. They're, they're far from him. They, they are chasing after other things. So he said this about the Jewish people. He's quoting Isaiah. Isaiah had said that. He's saying it. And I wonder if, uh, if this is actually a, a verse that hits home for us pretty heavy as far as today in the church. So as we look at this idea of worship, I want us to ask ourselves that. Is our heart really ex following after what we're expressing with our mouths? Are we really worshiping him? So have a few questions that I think we can ask ourselves um, as we look at this. And the first one is this. Do we serve God or money? Do I worship God or money? Sorry, I said serve, but worship. Am I worshiping God or am I worshiping money? Remember, he's saying there that their mouths are worshiping him, but our hearts are chasing after something else. Well, he expresses a sentiment like this in Matthew chapter 6. Now, we looked at Matthew chapter 6 last week. We used it as one of our passages, but I kind of want us to spend some time in this passage today and use it as the springboard for our whole message. Let's look what he says, Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 24. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now stop there for a second. Notice what he says here. Do not lay up for yourselves or store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I mean, in on earth. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Are you storing treasures on earth or are you storing treasures in heaven? Yeah, I couldn't help but thinking about storage facilities when uh, talking of, thinking about this passage. And where are we laying our treasures, storing our treasures? You know, it's interesting. I wish I would have invested in storage facilities 15 years ago. The storage facility industry has tripled in the last 25 years tripled in the last 25 years. It is a $39 billion industry in 2020. Um, there are over 60,000 facilities, and they estimate that over t about 10% of households pay an average of $88 a month for a storage facility today. And yet, our homes are much bigger than they used to be. In 1950, the average home was 983 square feet. 
And today, the average home is 2,250 square feet. The average home being built is 2,250 square feet. The median size home that people live in is 1,650 square feet because we still have some of those older homes. So, So we have to ask ourselves, where are we storing up our treasures? You know, I mean, why are we acquiring and acquiring so much more that we need bigger homes and we still need storage facilities on top of this? And the problem with this is it doesn't really seem to be any difference with, it, with Christians. We, we still have the same numbers when it comes to these things. So where is your treasure? See, it doesn't matter where you say your heart is. It matters where you show that your heart is. He goes on. Uh, let's, uh, okay, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, he's saying wherever you're storing your treasures, that's where your heart is going to be. That's where your focus is, is where you're storing your treasure. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. So it is your eye, is, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Isn't that so true that the eye is the lamp of our body? That where you're focusing is where your mind is. You know, I don't know if that's true with everybody, but I know for me, what what I'm looking at, what I'm allowing myself to focus on, that's where my mind goes, and that's where my heart goes. What grabs your attention? What are you, what are you focusing on? He goes on. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can't serve two masters. See, when we talk about worship, worship is the expression of both love and submission. Worship is submitting ourselves to God. See, Jesus was upset because he says, your mouths are worshiping, but your hearts aren't. And here in this passage, he's saying that if our hearts are not after God, then we're not truly worshiping him. We can't love and submit both to the desires of this world and to the desires of God. Now, if you're anything like me, this is a constant battle, right? I focus sometimes on the things of God, and oftentimes I'm focused on the things of this world, and I'm constantly having to remind myself. I'm constantly having to engage in the struggle because when, if I'm not engaged in it, I just allow myself to focus on the things of this world. I get pulled into that. So as I talk today... I want everyone to know here that my goal is not to guilt anyone. Um, you know, I don't want you to w- watch this, listen to this message, and then just feel guilty today. That's, that's not my intention. In fact, even as I was preparing this message, there were times I was feeling guilty. Um, you know, because it's so easy to just get caught up and feel guilty, feel bad about what we do. That's, that's not the intention here. Oftentimes, guilt makes us um, do things out of um, shame and feeling bad about ourselves. So what, what happens is we will do, we'll make a choice, we'll do something as a way to make ourselves feel better, but we're not actually changing our hearts. God doesn't want you to feel guilty because that's not going to change your heart. That might make you do something to make you feel better, but God wants us to be convicted from his word and the hope that it actually will begin to make transformation within our hearts. So so don't be don't be guilty today. Don't feel guilty, um, but but if you feel that the Holy Spirit is is moving through some of this, um, allow Him to convict you and allow Him to begin to change your heart and start to ask some of the questions on a real level. But before we go into that, because I want to make sure we're doing that, can, can let's just pray. I'd like us to pray together, and then we'll go on. God, uh, this is a tough issue for us. I know for me, I'm constantly battling my desire for more, the, the desire for the bright, shiny things that the world throws at us. Um, 
it's so easy to get caught up and feel like I don't have enough, to feel like others have more than me. And yet, God, I know as, as we fight these desires, we, we so often want to turn our hearts over to you, to just lay it all at your feet, to submit these things to you. And, but it's a battle. So, God, we just pray for your strength. We pray that your spirit convict us and that you give us clear direction on how we should move, on how we should live in regards to that which you bless us with. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're new with us, you just joined us last week or this week, um, you know, you might be kind of going, oh, man, they're just going to talk about money all the time. I want to say a couple things about that. First of all, um, we don't normally do that. Uh, we do a series on this probably about uh, every 18 months just to kind of really look at some of the things that Jesus talked about. Um, so I want to encourage you to hang in there with us um, as, you, as you're um, listening to these messages. But two, I would encourage you and challenge you to really look and say, hey, are these things that God is calling us to? Um, because I don't know if you realize this, but about a third, a little over a third of Jesus' parables actually deal with how we spend our money. Um, when you take those plus the many teachings, like the one we just read that aren't parables, um, it's estimated that about 25% of Jesus' teachings were on how we spend our money. And I think that's because God knows where our hearts are. He knows what we struggle with. And so he talks about this a lot because he wants us to know this is something that he cares about. But for today, I don't want to look at one of his parables. We'll be doing that in some of the um, messages. But today I want to turn to the Old Testament and we want to look at Ecclesiastes. Now, if uh, you may remember Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, and Solomon spent a lot of his years turning away from God and chasing after all the things that this world had to offer, and kind of, he had enough money and enough wisdom, enough power, that he pretty much had anything that his heart desired. And yet he found towards the end of his life that it left him empty. And, and here's what he said about chasing after the things that this world offers. But before we get into the passage, I want to have you ask yourself another question as we read this passage. And that's this. Am I content? Am I content? Remember last week, that's what we talked about. Contentment. That's a heart attitude that God calls us to have. Well, if you're wanting to ask yourself, do I worship God or do I worship money? Right? The first question I wanted us to ask was simply, where am I storing my treasures? Where am I storing my treasures? But to, right now I want us to ask, am I content? Do I have an attitude, at least an overall attitude, of contentment with what God has blessed me in? But let's look at what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 through 14. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Now let's stop there for a second. See what he's saying there? He says you're never going to be satisfied if you love money. It's insatiable. It's an insatiable desire. And I think it's interesting that anything that we try to fill our need for God with, any other substitute that we try to use, it becomes something we never have enough of. It becomes something that is in, insatiable because the true need is God. The true desire is God. And we keep looking for these other things, and they fill us for a short period, but then the need is back there again. So I don't care what it is, whether it be sex or power or drugs or fun or accomplishment or adventure or health or recognition or family or money, whatever that thing is, we never have enough. It always seems to be elusive. And he says, it's meaningless. It's a vanity, he says, when we chase after those things. He goes on. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Let's stop there for a second. See, studies have shown, studies have shown that actually, 
the more we have, the more we are enslaved to it. The more we have, the more we're enslaved to it. Um, that, that it begins to take over our time, our concerns, our worries, our thought processes when we, when we have more and more and more. So he's saying, what advantage is it? What advantage is it to us except to see that you have it? He goes on, verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer when he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So once again, he's saying, See, when you when you're working and just you're 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 working, you're getting enough to eat to take care of your daily needs, um, but you're not rich. You're you you work, you eat, you sleep, you you live fine. But when you have more, it begins to consume you to the point he's saying that we lose sleep over it, right? And once again, many studies have been done to show that the more we have, oftentimes, and the more we focus on what we have the more stress it causes, obviously, the meaning the more sleep we would get as well. There's actually a new term in the last few decades um, that um, is a part of therapy now called debt stress. People suffer from debt stress. They have so much debt and they're constantly consumed with their debt stress. And unfortunately, debt stress has no correlation to how much money you make. In fact, we, we have studies that show that throughout America, the, if someone is prone to debt, it doesn't matter what they make. Um, if they are making 40000 a year, they are usually in debt at a certain percent. If they increase their income to 80000 a year, they're in debt to a certain percent. If they increase it to 2000 a year, they're in debt to a certain percent. He goes on, verse 13. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. See, he's saying that, look, when we focus on keeping it, when it's all about me, when it's all mine, it actually causes us problems. We, we become hoarders of our wealth rather than sharing it, rather than being generous with it, which is one of the attitudes that we will talk about is generosity. Um, when we're never satisfied, what happens is we keep pushing. We just keep pushing for more and more, keep adding more stress, keep adding more um, pain, keep adding more separation from others and from God. We get this idea that if one is good, two is better. If two is good, four is better. If, if four is good, eight is better, and so on and so on. Um, when I was in high school, um, they introduced, 7-Eleven introduced the Big Gulp. If you're old enough to remember, you might remember when they first came out with these 32-ounce drinks. And before that, the average drink was about 20 ounces that you could buy. Well, as a high schooler, I was that was awesome. For a dollar, I could get a 32-ounce Coke. And, um, but what they found was once they did that, about every couple of years, they just kept adding bigger and bigger and bigger ones. It never was enough. It never was enough. Now they have the Team Gulp. If you've gone to 7-Eleven, if you might have seen this, they have the Team Gulp. It literally comes in a it, – it's like a thermos. It's a gallon of a drink. Now, I don't know how – I guess they call it a team gulp so when you're buying it, you don't feel as guilty because you think, oh, I'm taking this to a group of people. Um, like you're really going to all put a straw in there and all use it? Yeah. Um, it's for you. Let's just admit it. You want, you, we always want more. Verse 14. And those riches were lost in a bad venture, and he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. So once again, he's saying – Look, we've spent all this time worrying about it, but the truth is we can't. We don't know what's going to happen to it, right? We're not as in control as we think we are. Um, I've lived through a few of these things, the dot-com crash in 2000, uh, the 2008 crash. We're probably heading for another crash here very soon, um, the way things are going. We, we don't have as much control over our stuff as we think. Right. And and when we the more we have, the more we worry about it and losing it. And I love verse 15. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Remember, reminds me of that bumper sticker again. 
He who dies with the most toys still dies. So once again, Solomon here is just is clear that that the acquiring of stuff and the focus on that in our life leads to emptiness. Are we content or are we constantly wanting more? Can, are we going to heed the words of Solomon and 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 pr- start praying, asking God to give us an attitude and a heart of contentment with what he's blessed us in? Are we going to do the practices that I talked about last week as far as realizing it's all his, starting to be generous, and, and then just is submitting it all to him? Are we going to do that so that we can learn contentment? Or are we going to keep trying to hold on and fall into these traps? Now, in another book that Solomon wrote, he, gave, he actually gives us a solution to this. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, Solomon says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth, and with your first fruits of all your produce. So that leads us to another question. Is God honored with my finances? Is God honored with my finances? Now, I think every one of us makes mistakes in our finances. Every one of us does things that are not God honoring with our money. However, I also think we can we can sit and evaluate and say, you know what? Is my is my daily goal, my my consistent goal, to seek to honor God? And 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 if someone were to look through my finances, knowing that God does look through my finances, would he say, Yeah, I see you seeking to honor me with your finances? Or are your finances just serving you? Are your finances just serving your desires, your needs, your wants? And when I say needs, I mean the things you think you need, right? Remember what Paul said? If we have food and clothing, we are happy. And when he says clothing, I don't think Paul was donating bag, uh, trash bags worth of clothes to the goodwill every other year. I think he meant if we have clothes on our back, I'm, we're happy. We're content. I want to just challenge you and encourage you to really deal with these three questions. To, to maybe go home today and, and talk about them with your spouse. If you're married. If you're not married, um, maybe find someone else um, to just talk about them with. If not, at least spend some real time on them. Pray about them. Ask yourself these three questions. I want to close by giving some just what I would call some, just look at some practical things to help us think about this. Um, I, I found an article by, there's a magazine called Relevant Magazine. It's a really good magazine. If you're um, looking for a magazine on faith and how to live out your faith in a relevant way in society, it's a great magazine. Um, but in Relevant Magazine, they had a article entitled, what would happen if the church tithed? What would happen if the church tithed? Now, we're not a church that talks a lot about, hey, you have to tithe. I, I, we focus a lot more on, are you giving generously and sacrificially? Are you sacrificially giving? Um, and my main reason for that is, I think tithe is a great goal. Um, but I, I know for Tanya and I, we've, we've moved past the tithe. I know other people who have moved past the tithe. Um, because if, I, if you have that, well, I'm tithing, I'm good, then, then honestly, it, it gets to a point where you just kind of, you become self-righteous about that. But I also know people that if you haven't given at all, man, that to say, well, I guess if I'm going to give, I have to give 10%, that might be really hard for you to just make that step and, and not kind of keep putting it out there and learning and growing. So, so we, I would say starts just with something sacrificially, but, but I do think that we, we are called to, to look to that, to, to a tithe. So relevant magazine said, what if the church tithe? Now to start off, it gave some statistics on what the, the giving situation of the church actually looks like today. 
So let me give you some of those numbers. Tithers today make up only 10 to 25% of a normal congregation. 25% being extremely high. I do not know a church. I've never seen a church that has 25% of the uh, people be tithers. My guess is those are very small churches with a few very, very committed families. Um, from my best estimations, I would say our church is probably in that 12 to 15 percent of our congregation are tithers. Five, only five percent of the of um, of U.S. I'm sorry, only five percent of the U.S. tithes. So five percent of people in the U.S. tithe, with 80 percent of Americans only giving two percent of their income. So 80% of Americans actually only give 2% of their income. This one, this number blew my mind. This number shows how far off we have gotten in our culture. Christians are only giving 2.5% per capita, so um, per per person in the family, 2.5%. While during the Great Depression, they gave 3.3%. Now think about that. 2.5% now versus 3.3% in the greatest economic downfall in the last 150 years in our country. That shows a lot to me of how far off we've gotten. So I, I want you to think about that, and I want you to ask yourself this question. How much money or how rich would you have to think of yourself before you would just start making a decision to tithe, right? Now, once again, I want to remind you, I'm not trying to guilt anyone. I'm just trying to be real about the numbers. If you think this is uncomfortable for you, imagine being me. I'm the one having to talk about it, okay? Think about this. Ask yourself, how much, how rich would I have to consider myself to decide to be a tither? Well, if you as a family, as a household, Make 125000 a year. You are in, and that means you're two adults with three kids. Two adults with three kids. If you make 125000 a year, you are in the top 2.2% of the richest people on earth. Now, if you were to tithe 10% of that, you would still be in the top 2.8% of the richest people on earth. So it didn't even move you down a percent. That's 25 times the global average. You'd be, you'd be making 25 times the global average. Now, if you make $20,000 a year, so now you, not, that's not household, but $20,000 a year, so maybe you're single and make 25, or not, I'm sorry, 20,000. If you're single and make 20,000, or as a married couple, you make 40,000. You are in the richest 7.7% of the people on earth. And if you tithed, you would still be in the richest 7.9% of the richest people on earth. So that just kind of gives us something to think about as we kind of think, oh, I just, as soon as I get to that level, right? As soon as I, I'm, I'm here, then I'll tithe. I am, now, some of you are thinking, well, you see, the church just wants our money. Church wants my money. The church has always wanted my money. Here's what I would challenge you with. If you're thinking that, don't give one penny to our church or any church. But let me give you an option. I found an organization called Giving What We Can. It's called givingwhatwecan.org. And this organization has done all the studies on the top most productive nonprofit charities to help with things like clean water, food, and medicine for basic needs of people around the world. Um, oh, and, and housing. Givingwhatwecan.com or .org. And they, um, to get together, everyone, every member of this has over 6,000 members. They have all committed to give 10% of their income to benefiting people around the world. So if you feel that the church wants my money, don't give us one penny. But look here and do that. And start, maybe you can't do the 10% yet. 
but but go there and start with two percent or three percent and and make a decision to start giving my point is this we have to understand it's not just about you it's not just about your heart it's not just about what god wants to do with you it's about what god wants for the world we get so caught up in us and it kind of worries me about the church today you know i was reading revelation and revelation 3:17 says for you say i am rich I have prospered and I need nothing. But realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. See, he's warning the church. He says, hey, look. You kind of say, hey, look at us. We've, we've made it. Look how, look how well we're doing. But he's saying when it comes to the spiritual things, you're wretched. You're blind. We don't want that to be our warning as a church. Now, I, and I want to close with this. I want to close by just looking at what the church could do if Christians actually tithe to the church. See, churches oftentimes have money problems. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the building and where we're at with that and what we need. We wouldn't have to ever have those talks. We wouldn't ever have to do a campaign for buildings. We wouldn't have to do a campaign for anything if churches tithe. In fact, here's what would happen if churches tithe. Churches would be debt-free across the nation. They'd be debt-free when it comes to mortgages, um, anything like that. But on top of that, ministry that would be able to happen if churches tithe. $25 billion, okay, and this is over five years. Over five years, $25 billion could go to relieve global hunger, starvation, and deaths from preventable diseases in those five years. $12 billion could go to eliminate illiteracy. $15 billion could go to solve the world's water and sanitation issues, spe um, specifically at places where the world has, um, I'm sorry, places in the world where one billion people live on less than a dollar a day. One billion dollars could go to fully fund all overseas missions work. And that would leave over a hundred billion dollars for additional ministry expansions. All of that could happen in five years if the American church would tithe. I don't know about you, but that humbles me to think about where we're at right now. See, I oftentimes hear people say, well, why does God allow people to starve? Why does God allow people to die of uh, curable diseases? If there's a good loving God, why, is he, why doesn't he have a plan for that? Guess what? God has a plan for it. God has the same plan for that problem as he has for the problem of people going to hell. He says, I'm going to build a church and the church is going to do the work. So it's not that we should be pointing at God and blaming him. We should be looking at our own hearts and looking at ourselves, and saying, God, what would you have me do? Now, before we close, I mentioned some pretty big issues around the world. One issue I have a huge heart for in our country and something that I feel is of some of the biggest need in America is the issue of the struggles that teens go through. Um, we see teen suicides at, at record highs, um, the issues with social media and drugs and um, uh, peer pressures and societal pressures and all the things that kids struggle with. Um, being a teenager in our culture is extremely hard. And one thing I'm super proud of at MBF Church is our youth ministry. You know, when we very first started, um, one of the things that we said, you know what, we, are, we have got to do when we start this church is we have to start with a, a youth program, a teen ministry. And from the very beginning, 
we have had a ministry for teenagers and um and it's been effective we've seen a lot of growth in um teens lives and we've seen teens give their life to the lord we've seen teens serve the lord grow to serve the lord my three adult children grew up in this um, to youth ministry and all three of them um, have a desire to know God, love God, to serve him with their lives, to, to use their lives as um, a, a, an opportunity to serve him. And I believe a lot of that has to do with the effectiveness of the youth ministries that we've had here. And, and so as we close today, I mentioned, I, I just want to highlight different ministries. Um, I want to highlight our youth ministry. Our youth ministry has some powerful things going on for teens. And when you give to MBF Church, you are supporting this important ministry. Uh, my name's Spud. Um, I'm the youth pastor here at MVF Church. Are you going to swivel in the chair? No. My name is Spud. I'm the youth pastor here at MVF Church. And welcome to my office, guys. I am shoved out here in the far corner underneath the tree and I swiveled again. Probably winter camp you know, or um, the lip sync battle. That was so good. Winning the lip sync battle. <laughs> yeah, I won it. It was so good. We would have slip and slides, like super intense slip and slides, where you'd go down these huge hills and we'd build pyramids and send people down on top of shoulders, and it was awesome. I'm riding up the, the lift and there Cameron is laying on the ground and one ski is pointing straight up and down in the snow and he looks like a pretzel laying on the ground. There was this trash can game where you'd be holding onto ropes and you'd try and get the other person to hit the trash can and people would do like flips over it. That was an epic game. The reason I got involved with youth group is because I know how important it is to catch the minds of, and hearts of the youth at the age they are so that it doesn't take a huge life altering decision later on in life that's a lot harder to get to. I want them to get to know Jesus and, and get to know how important it is to have community at a young age. Um, the leaders that I had like changed, reshaped my opinions about things um, that weren't necessarily like bibl biblically accurate. And so it helped me like love people in a deeper way. To me, youth group is a place where you can go and meet people that have the same beliefs as you and who are um, willing to love you through the trials that you're going through in that time. And where I can now love the kids who come in through the doors. I learned that just being in community and just like having fellowship with people, especially at church, like opposed from just like your other friends is super important just to like have fellow friends that love Jesus. <laughs> it's good to have that. I really enjoy working with youth, especially they're at that time in their life when they're trying to decide, hey, does this stuff make sense for me? And is this a place I want to be? And I like being a part of helping them make that decision. I, I like I like helping them realize that yes, this this is where I want to be, and it is for me.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath is living water, search your fall was finished out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of kings. You Hey everybody, thank you once again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the message. You guys have a blessed day.